Device 8. By representing to the soul the outward mercies that vain men enjoy and the outward miseries that they are freed from whilst they have walked in the ways of sin. His conscience isn't bothering him. He doesn't have the strife and the difficulty that we have. Why should I pursue this hard Christian life when those around me, they don't have the same troubles that I do? What's the point? Where do I get something for all of my trouble, for all of my work? If people think this way frequently, they selectively look at those around them and draw things from their life and say, I wish I had what he had, I wish I had what he had. But you really don't know his whole picture and you don't know the other person's picture. But you look at it and say, there's some real desirable elements there. The people of God often struggle with various degrees of envy. Look at Jeremiah verse 15. And all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, and all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros, answered Jeremiah. Now, keep in mind, there are lots of people here. This is not just a small group. This is a whole crowd. This is what the crowd believes. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But... We will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, were well off, and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. I can't imagine another prophet being as frustrated as Jeremiah was. The kind of irrational response that is portrayed here makes your head spin. To see people respond in this way is lunacy taken to a new level. Something's wrong with the mind that can draw a cause and effect relationship like this. You see, they looked around at the other nations. They looked around at people outside of them and said, you know, something's not right here. Other nations don't have near the difficulties that we have, which was not true. Had they listened to other prophets, they would have seen they were in grave danger as well. But what happens? They look around and say, you know, this following God business is nothing but a struggle. And back when we burned incense and made cakes to the Queen of Heaven, we had a good didn't we? Things were good back then. And Jeremiah, as for you, we're not going to listen to this nonsense. We're going to follow our own religious practices because, well, the economy's good. Prosperity and comfort are not the measure of life. Remedy number one, that no man knows how the heart of God stands by his hand. It's difficult to see how people are supported in life. And by supported, I don't necessarily mean the amount of money they have or their job or their living, but how are they sustained by God himself? How is it that God keeps some people in their position, seems to provide for them and care for their needs in the broader sense, not just the economic sense? It's very difficult to understand how and why that happens. There are are plenty of prosperous, wicked men out there. Well, if it's difficult to measure a man's livelihood, how hard is it to measure a man's soul? How do you know what's inside a man? The turmoil or the torment that he suffers? You don't. God's ways are not our ways, and he accomplishes things in a much more complicated fashion than you and I will ever know. The hand of God was sorely set against them, in this example, Job, and yet the heart and bowels of God were strongly working towards them. You see, it looked like God was very much against Job, but he wasn't, was he? He was very much for Job. No man knows either love or hatred by outward mercy or misery. For all things come alike to all, to the righteous and to the unrighteous, to the good and to the bad, to the clean and to the unclean. The sun of prosperity shines as well upon brambles of the wilderness as upon the fruit trees of the orchard. The snow and hail of adversity lights upon the best garden as well as upon the stinking dunghill or the wild waste. You see, when you measure what's happening in other people's lives, what happens to them that doesn't happen to you. You see, we share a common lot in life with the wicked. We live in one world. We can't always see what's going on inwardly, and we certainly can't see what design God has in mind as he orders the circumstances of our life. Job had no idea what was happening while he endured the trials that he had, the loss of his children, the loss of all his earthly goods and the comfort of his wife. He had no idea. All was taken from him. And yet was God set against him? Not for one moment. God knew exactly what he was doing and was bringing Job through a very difficult time. But all the while, it was because of love, the great love that God had for him. God never forgets his people. He never has a bad thought toward his people. 
He never forgets what they need. He never ignores them. He looks at us at all times with the eye of seeing nothing but the righteousness, the value, and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he who sent his son to die for us will not now surely forget us. And though he brings difficult times to us, he's not going to ignore the work that Christ has done. Everything that comes from God to his people is good. Everything that comes from God to the wicked is bad. The outward mercies they enjoy, they abuse, and they will pay for it dearly. The miseries that you have in this life will be nothing compared to that which comes in the hereafter. What God is doing in you is a marvelous work, is a beautiful thing to behold. The economy is not the measure of a man. God's people frequently have trouble measuring the thoughts of God towards them. But God's word makes it abundantly clear that he is working all things for his glory and through his plan of redemption. There's never anything that happens to us that is not part of this great plan. Nothing. It does you no good to envy the wicked, to look at their circumstances and say, they've got it better than I do. Psalm 73, we have a picture, a story, a recounting of a man who grew envious of the wicked. He looked at their life and he made their prosperity his measure. And he said, you know, I like what they have. A Psalm of Asaph, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And what happened? His heart was carried away at what the wicked had. He saw the boastful making claims. No retribution, no punishment, nothing was difficult for them. What's the point in serving God, following these regulations and rules? In verse 16, he says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. See, by the time he went in to worship God, he realized that all the ways of our lives and their lives are ordered by God. And he has an end in mind. When he went to worship God, he saw his Redeemer. He saw that his life was secure. And the contrast is not now between the prosperity and the boasting of the wicked, but the foundation upon which their feet stand. Surely I saw that God sets them in slippery places. The wicked, are they on such sure footing as they make themselves to sound? No, they are in a slippery place. Their feet shall slide in due time. In verse 21 through 26, he says, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart heart and my portion forever. Observing what God has done or is doing to the wicked is not wrong in and of itself, but you must look at the big picture or you're likely to faint. You look at any one individual person and you start uh, coveting what they have, you become envious at what they have, you'll grow weary and you may faint, just as Asaph was on the virtue of fainting. Brooks offers a very good rule of thumb. Usually the worst of men have most of these outward things and the best of men have least of earth though most of heaven. Oftentimes the wicked enjoy tremendous prosperity over and above many Christians. They do. It's a way of life. And if that bothers you, then you need to go into the house of the Lord and consider their end. You need to worship your Redeemer so you can get your perspective again and say, I'm not going to envy the boasting or the wealth of the wicked. It's not worth it. It is an attempt to draw us to sin when we focus on those things which they have and ignore the things that we have.